on. Here she is. Claire Furin. Hello, Claire. How's it going? Hello again. Not sure we would be here. We would be here if it wasn't also for this lady, right? That is correct, because Claire is one, one of the one who started all. Call it as well. That so thank good. you. Thank you for taking. Here they are, all coming part. here. There we go. Welcome, Anil. Welcome, Bob. And we're gonna also welcome Stony into the mix. Thank you. Great and to be here. Ricardo. And now, Claire, the floor is yours. Enjoy. Enjoy. Ciao, Ricardo. Hey, everyone. Hello. Uh, thank you so much for being here, Guy and the team. Thank you for having us. So as you said, Guy, we're here to talk about business models. I know a lot of you in the audience have been asking about this panel. I'm, I'm very excited about it. Um, I think we've established that the co-living sector is wide and diverse. Um, different companies have different models, both in terms of property development and operational strategies. Uh, so the big question, the big last question for today is, shall co-living companies opt for asset light or asset heavy? integrated strategy. Uh, we'll talk about all those different ways to, to crack the, the nut for the co-living business model. But before we do that, uh, let's do a round of introduction with our four, four panelists, Anil Kara from Node, Bob Kennedy from Six Peak Capital, Ricardo Tassaro from Gravity Co-living, and Stoney Cox from Nomos Group. Um, Anil, what about... Um, you start telling us who you are, what you do, and um, you know why you like the summit, if you do. <laughs> I think we need to unmute Anil, please. Okay. Hi guys, thanks Claire for your help. Awesome to be here. Thanks everyone for tuning in. So Anil Kara, founder and CEO of Node. We started five years ago and we are a vertically integrated, you know, co-living and apartment company. Um, on both sides of the pond, both in Europe and North America. And so really excited to talk about what we're up to and hear from some of the other guys on the team. Now we lost you, Claire. <laughs> That's right, Claire's on mute. There we go. Can you hear me now? Okay, <laughs> that would have been difficult. Um, what about you, Bob? Uh, thanks, Claire. It's great to be here. I'm Bob Kennedy uh, with Six Peak Capital. Uh, we are a real estate private equity firm um, uh, based in North America, uh, headquartered in New York with offices in, in Venice, California. Uh, we are vertically integrated in that we are a developer, uh, GC, and uh, construction firm. Um, however, we don't do any co-living operations ourselves. Uh, we prefer to hand over the keys once the building is finished uh, to, an op to a third-party operator. We have uh, 23 projects in New York, Chicago, uh, Los Angeles, and uh, Seattle, um, representing about uh, 2,500 beds across that portfolio. Super impressive. Uh, Stoney, you and Bob know each other, I guess. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> we talk to each other almost every day. It's good to see you, Bob. <laughs> Likewise, Stoney. <laughs> see everybody here. Did you want me to go next thing, Claire? Yes, please. Great. Yeah, so Nomos Group is a, a, a boutique merchant banking platform uh, focused at, at the innovative frontier of real estate kind of evolution. And we do a lot of work in the co-living space. So... Um, as a merchant bank, I'm both an investor, or we are investors and advisors across the spectrum. So I'm an investor in three different operating companies, a variety of assets, um, also very closely involved with Six Peak, um, and we advise on sort of structuring and raising capital um, in a variety of different formats, um, but evolving more and more into the asset-heavy piece and funding real estate um, itself promise for a lively discussion in a few minutes. Um, Ricardo, last but not least, with Gravity Co-Living. Thank you, Claire, and hi, everyone. Here's Ricardo. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Gravity Co-Living. We're an asset light co-living brand in London. Uh, we typically partner up with institutional lenders and help them design and operate their buildings. At the moment, we're only operating in London, but we're looking to launch our first overseas property in continental Europe uh, next year. Awesome, thank you, Ricardo. 
Um, so we are going to dive into uh, the nits and bits of uh, co-living business models, but before and because we anticipated anticipated sorry a little bit of Zoom fatigue, we're going to do a little game. It's a very simple yes and no, yes or no actually uh, game. Do you all have your signs? Yes, yeah. indeed. Okay, in the audience, yes. you can also vote uh -oh. on Zoom on the chat if you want. Oh, Ricardo. Oh, it doesn't have work with the uh, background. <laughs> I'm gonna have to remove to... the background, I think. Yes. Um, so I guess the, the first question that um, comes out of those this little game is, what is for you the value proposition of co-living for your residents on one side and for investors on, on the other side? What about we start with you, Ricardo? Sure. So for the residents, I think the main value proposition is flexibility uh, and you know connectivity as well. So as in, you know, if you're moving from uh, from overseas into a new city, uh, you would want to have a flexible approach to to living. So you you wouldn't want to be stuck on a long term contract. Uh, at the same time, you'd want to have to you want to be integrated within the community within the city as quickly as possible. So I think that these two by far are the most important aspect. Uh, from an investor's perspective, I think well, I think you can look at it from real estate investors or more VC type investors, but. I think the, the predictability of, of the business and scalability of the business are certainly major uh, positive factors. Uh, the uh, resiliency of the business in even in uh, difficult situations like what we've all gone through, we've all been through in the past 12 months. And of course the returns, the attractive returns. Bob, can you give us your uh, perspective from, from the real estate investment side particularly? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, you know from the from the consumer's perspective, the tenants' uh, you know perspective, um, affordability is the most important component of co living. I think uh, convenience, and by convenience, I mean more flexible lease terms that Ricardo just touched on, uh, as well as a turnkey living solution, are really important. Um, community is also important, but I think on that list of um, what I describe as the three C's: cost, convenience, and community. It's probably in in that order. Um, and from a real estate developer and investor's perspective, um, you're, it's really twofold. You know, by adding bedroom density, you can bring the price point down on a per person basis, which means that your addressable market um, is larger. You have more tenants um, that are available um, that can meet your you know, credit requirements. Um, but you, also, you can also drive um, rents or net operating income on a per square foot per meter you know, per unit basis. Um, and it's really those two things. Um, and, and we got excited about co-living originally because it was a win-win you know, sort of solution um, for everybody uh, involved. Right. I pretty much agree with that. Uh, Stoney, you have a VC hat in addition to the real estate perspective. Can you give us your point of view? Sure. I mean, I guess my view, um, investing really early days into the operating companies themselves was really more about sort of um, cultivating and fostering um, a community of people that would add what I think of as kind of the third element to the co-living story, which is higher density, better common spaces, and then an operator to curate sort of experiences and actually create the events and interactions that lead to a real community. And my view is, is that that was really missing. I started investing in the space, I guess, formally in sort of 2013, 2014. And it was a lot about that sort of community creation, uh, culture creation, you know, a lot of dinner parties and a lot of cool music events and those sort of things. But I, th and I think my view is, is that that is a really, that that is the sort of activator for these buildings that are higher density. You know, what I'm not necessarily convinced of is that these should be valued as tech companies and that they're sort of infinitely scalable and that they should be, you know, shooting for kind of 10x returns in three years. I think that um, in conjunction with the uplift in the value of the real estate itself, um, the operating companies are valuable and that at a certain scale, you can achieve real efficiencies, but that you sort of have to get there first. And that can be, I think, you know, a long road. So that's kind of my venture, my venture hat on it. Um, but, uh, in, in our prep call, you said, I think you said 
mixing is tr is tricky when talking about VC and real estate money. Can you expand on that? Yeah, that's yeah. My view is is that it's there's sort of two buckets of capital that invest in co living, and you've got you know venture capital that is in fact looking for very highly scalable solutions, probably very asset light because of course you know building buildings, owning buildings does does take a lot of money, and they are. I think it's important to match. Um, the structure and the alignment of your investors, as well as their sort of perceived cost of capital, and that venture people should be investing primarily in asset light ideas, and that real estate people should be investing directly in buildings, and that commingling those two ideas kind of has the potential to leave both sides um, feeling a little bit uh, unrewarded. <laughs> <laughs> and Neil, do you agree with that opinion? Yeah, I do actually. I do think there's uh, there's a danger on the one source of capital versus the other, and what you can promise them. So I, I think we've talked about this a bit. Yeah, I do agree. And what's the the value proposition of Node for its residents versus for its uh, investors? Sure, um, we really view ourselves as a lifestyle solution for aspirational city living. So it's touching on those three C's, but when you put it together, it's like if you're moving to a city or living in a big city, how can we make that better in all of these ways? You know, the convenience side, being a nice space, being around great people. And when you put that together, it's like we're, we're lifestyle solution providers. Um, from an investor perspective, uh, given, you know, we'll talk about asset right and, uh, you know, what I call having your cake and eating it too. Um, what we're trying to do is provide the upside of being in a disruptive part of a very scalable industry, yet give investors the downside protection of owning the bricks and mortar. And so, you know, having some upside of like, hey, this is an imminently scalable business, you can do lots of things, but actually still um, having some connection to real estate. So it's not just dependent on operations. It's also, you know, anchored at bricks and mortar. And so giving that hybrid risk adjusted return uh, is really what we focus on for our business and our investors. Okay, Build them up, building up uh, just that, Let, let's talk about this asset light versus asset heavy battle or asset right um, <laughs> balance maybe. Um, and we're gonna start with you, Anil and Ricardo. Both of you have chosen pretty opposite strategies for your co-living brands and, and operations. Can you describe to our audience here the underlying logics of your respective models? Uh, tell us if you think they fall under asset light or something else um, and why you think you're better than the other. You go first, Ricardo. I'll be next. <laughs> I mean, I'll start with saying I don't think one is necessarily better than the other. I just think it's every every operating structure has its its time. So for us, when we when we launched Gravity, um, you know, the idea was we wanted to we thought it was an emerging uh, market co living, so it was very untapped at least in Europe or in London. We thought the best way to go to market for us was to do it on an asset light basis because the, the capital requirements were lower. You know, but the possibility of actually having a presence in the London market was, you know, was a lot faster uh, by doing an asset light. Um, and, you know, overall, we just felt like it was the right way, the best way to go from zero to, let's say, 500 beds. Having said that, we don't plan to be exclusively asset light for the rest of our existence. Uh, we want to, you know, we want to take the, all the benefits of being asset light now that we're small and agile and get to a point when we get to, let's say, roughly 500 beds, where we can start doing uh, both the assets and so opco propco, same thing as Anil is doing at the moment. Okay. So that, that, uh, that's really our strategy. Right, thanks Ricardo. So Anil, Ricardo was smart enough not to take sides. <laughs> what's, your, what's your side? Well, I'll take sides to make it fun. So um, look, there, you can start from either end of the spectrum, um, but if you want to step back and look at the hotel industry, Hilton started as asset heavy. They owned hotels. They then built an operations around it. They then showed that that proof of concept because they owned their assets and did a really good job with them and built a business around it. They then recapitalized themselves and effectively became asset light in some way or asset right because they found a way to still control the assets whether it was through long-term management contracts 
or actually having key money or sponsoring a REIT that they might own, et cetera. And so they're kind of sponsors of the asset, but leveraging other people's uh, in there. And so, you know, we followed a little bit more of that track in our journey where we came in heavy because um, we wanted to have the freedom to control the assets and experiment with things, which sometimes landlords don't let you do. Um, we think that's important. We also really, at the end of the day, believe that most of the value created in the value chain gets capitalized in the asset. I mean, assets trade at 4% yields, which are 25 times multiples, you know? And so actually, if you can increase, and you know, we were talking, you know, Bob was talking about density and getting higher income. If you can increase that income through a concept, actually the highest multiple, once you're at stabilization, is actually that 25 times multiple on the real estate as opposed to maybe an opco that may, might be five to 10 times once you're at growth phase, you know, and you're stabilized. So we, we, we think actually like being close to the assets, being aligned with the assets is actually being more closely aligned with the value creation. But we also think that there is this migration that you can see uh, over time uh, between the two models. And, you know, maybe there is a happy medium. Okay, so if I try to rephrase here, both of you, um, are doing your proofs of concepts through owning your real estate or not, but then you see a future where um, just like the hospitality industry, your brands will be able to control through the right governance system, the use of the real estate that you're doing, right? And so from that point of onwards, doesn't really matter who owns the real estate. I, I think for us, it's, you know, we want to be asset light at this point. We think we can create uh, good, you know, good value for our investors as well. And it's the fastest way to go to market, as I said earlier. Going forward, we don't want to just be owning and operating every single asset we, we're going to open in the future. But we want to be able to diversify and having both management contracts with third party owners, lease contracts with third party owners, as well as our own assets that we may own fully or co-own with some of the real estate investors that we're working with today. Okay, um, so Bob, you, as I understand it, are a pure Propco investor. What's your take on all this? And do you, do you think that the Upco and the Propco need to be separate at all times? Uh, I don't think that Opco Propco has to be separated at all times. I think it can work. I think it's really challenging, which is why we avoided it. We wanted to be the Propco behind innovative Opcos. Um, I think Anil said it, you know, really well. Um, Stony touched on it as well. Um, venture capital and real estate are just two entirely different asset classes. They have different tolerances for risk. They have different uh, return expectations. When you blend those together. Stoney said, you disappoint everybody. Um, you don't grow as fast as your venture capital investors want you to grow. Um, and you're probably taking more risk than your real estate investors want you to take. Um, and it's just, it's, it's harder to make all of that work. And so what we decided to do, which is not necessarily the right thing, um, we said, let's focus on raising capital from real estate investors, but let's push them a little bit up that risk spectrum, more toward venture capital, um, so that they're getting, um, again, to use Anil's words, they're getting uh, exposure or upside from innovation, but still the downside protection from real estate. But we're not going to push them all the way over to the other side and say, you know, we need, we need capital for operations as, as well. Um, and so what I love is that we're well positioned to work with lots of different operators, um, you know, with, with, with different business models. Um, and in some ways we can scale with them, clearly not at the, at, the, um, at the pace that they have. But what's interesting is that even today, uh, we still have this debate internally all the time. Um, if we were just to keep, I mentioned that we have 2,500 beds uh, either delivered or currently in development. If we were to just keep all of those ourselves um, and start sort of an operations uh, business, we would be one of the largest co-living companies uh, in the country. But uh, operations, it's difficult. Uh, it's a low margin business. Um, I used to have a janitorial uh, and um, property management business. And that's something that I just never want to do again. So I'm happy to let Ricardo, Anil, you know, Star City, Common, et cetera, um, deal with the brain damage of property management. Uh, thank you, Bob. Stoney, what's, what's your take on all this? And can you talk to us about valuation? 
in regards to the, the model that the companies are choosing? Sure. No, happy to do the valuation one. And then I might have sort of a more thorny issue hand grenade to throw in to, to create a little bit of um, discussion at the end. But, um, but, but valuation, I mean, you know, my view is that, uh, again, sort of venture groups are always looking for these very, very, you know, they, 10x is often not enough. They want to be at 100x. So they want to imagine a future that is over a short period of time that can get them to many, many multiples on their, their dollars invested. And so if you sort of say, okay, we need $3 million to have a team of 10 people, you know, doing co-living operations, and you're only willing to sell X percent of your company, you know, 10%, 20%, then sort of deductively your company's worth, you know, $30 million. And you just sort of go, that, that relies on ever higher valuations and an ever larger sort of scalability sort of plan. Um, but those valuations are very high for asset light businesses. And I think particularly we're high, you know, sort of early days um, in, in the evolution of the co-living sector. On the other side, you know, if you're looking for returns in, in real estate, you're kind of looking exactly as Anil said, you know, for a five, 4%, 5%, you're sort of happy with as a yield, which is, you know, not even a multiple, right? It's just sort of getting, getting little bits of your dollars back over time. However, those buildings themselves are worth much more. Um, and then I think there's this sort of piece in the middle that, that is maybe not talked about or was not talked about as much early days, which is sort of the funds management business. Now that is actually an asset light business that is highly scalable as you increase AUM. Because I mean, I know a number of family offices that you know run with three people that'll run you know a billion dollars of, of real estate. Now that's that's mixing apples and oranges because that's you know assets, but with that same group of three they could very happily run, you know, another $2 billion worth of other people's money and sort of charge fees and promotes on that. So I think those are all just kind of interesting elements to think about in terms of valuation. And it's just about kind of um, connecting the puzzle pieces in the right way, depending on which investors, you know, are at the table and, and what, you know, their sensibilities are. So that um, hopefully that wasn't too sort of, uh, you know, obtuse. But my, my question that I had for people, because I know Neil mentioned control. He sort of said, oh, Hilton spun out and they managed to maintain control, um, even though they sort of went asset light. And, and I guess my question also maybe to the group, maybe this is for Bob and, and Ricardo, is who do you think should control the building? The owner or the, or the operator, the co-living you know, operator? In other words, if I may add a piece to the question, Who's creating the value for the building? Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll just raise my hand and say, you know, I think I think the operator is creating a lot of the value in the building. Um, without the operator, you would have um, this completely non-traditional building with, you know, a bunch of five bedroom, five bathroom apartments that nobody knows what what to do with it. Um, so I think operations are 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 critical. Um, but we need each other, right? Um, the, the building owners need the operators, the operators need the buildings. Um, and so you can either decide to combine those two things and be the, the, the developer, the owner, the operator, um, or you can have that sort of prop go op go model. And I don't think there's, there's, you know, any definitive answer. We've had investors turn us down because we, we are not vertically integrated owner operator and said, well, you know, do you think we could, if we did this with you, if we gave you $100 million to, to do programmatic uh, purpose-built co-living, do you think we could also get, you know, options or warrants in, you know, Common, if we chose them as our operator or Star City or, you know, or whoever, or could we invest in their, in their next round? Um, but we've also had other, other investors who have come to us and said, um, I'm not interested in figuring out who the winner is going to be in co-living operations. I'd rather own the building and then be able to just plug and play whatever operator emerges as the leader in, in co-living. And Neil, I see you noting, no, no pun intended to uh, respond to that. Yeah, um, the golden rule is whoever has the gold makes the rules. And so <laughs> if you put in a hundred million bucks into a building, you're gonna wanna control that building. That's the bottom line. If you, on the other hand, have taken the riskiest portion uh, of 
what this building could do, i.e. maybe you took a master lease on it and you're taking that first dollar or euro of risk, but you get that upside, then maybe you are the gold because you're, you're, you know, you're taking that up and down. And so, you know, my view on this is the person who controls it is the one who's taking the real risk and putting the most money or capital at risk. And that can pivot based on the structure of how you do the deal. Traditionally, no, if you think about it um, from a Propco side, um, in at least the apartment industry, student housing industry, it's the Propcos that control everything. And the Opcos have terminable contracts, 60 days notice, right? And the hotel one, um, because it's been more bespoke over a long period of time, and it's much more operationally intensive, have worked their way into encumbering assets with like 30 year management contracts. But we're not there today unless you encumber it with a master lease to get into that control position on it. So right now the control side might be if you take a master lease, which you know in my view can be extremely risky and a great way to go bankrupt every cycle. Um, but but you know, which happens, right? Um, with most highly levered opcos, right? Um, we've seen a, a bunch not just real estate related blow up every cycle that this happens. So I would say it kind of depends, but I think it's about who put in the riskiest money and gets the reward. They kind of are the ones that usually end up controlling it. Uh, thanks, Anil. Rick, I actually wanted to ask you the question of um, the the sustainability and the, the business meaning of it, of the, of the master lease. Uh, what's, what's your take on that? Especially, especially given the fact maybe that when you start a co-living business, sometimes it's your only choice, right? Yeah, I mean, I think in, in Europe right now, the only option really, the only viable option for operators today is to get, just to sign uh, IRI or FRI leases to begin with. A lot of operators I see in Europe are starting maybe to diversify the risk a bit more. Instead of taking entire buildings, they're taking individual units, units, which is not something that we decided to do in the first place because we felt like from a brand perspective it was not the right thing to do. Um, certainly there are risks. Uh, by you know, in taking uh, long-term leases, uh, I think it's also, you know, the risk it, it goes up uh, significantly depending on the type of investor you have behind. If you have investors that are only valuing growth rather than valuing profitability, then of course that can put you in a very unpleasant situation. Luckily, that's not the case for us. We va we value growth, and I think we've been growing uh, relatively fast in the past two three years. But at the same time, we would never sign leases where we don't have at least our target, you know, 20% margin or whatever the, the target margin might be for the specific location. Having said this, going forward, it's, it's in our roadmap to start diversifying, as I said earlier, from just IRI lease agreement and FRI lease agreements to management agreements, revenue share agreement, as well as potentially co-investing alongside uh, developers that we work with. So to answer your question, I think it's, uh, it's the only option for European uh, co-living startups or specifically in London. I know France is pretty much the same. Uh, long term, I think it's, if, if someone can, 100%, it's better to diversify with uh, other operating structures. Yeah, I, I agree with you, at least for the French market. Um, most of, of local operators here have had to start with leases but they are already diversifying now. Uh, so speaking of growth, I think we only have 10 minutes late, le uh, left, sorry. I, I wanted to touch upon growth and how to scale and what's the right speed to scale when you're operating a co-living business. Um, what, Bob, you said something interesting to me uh, when we prepped this call, you said you came up or we're working on, I, I, I don't, I'm not really sure, templates and blueprints for uh, successful co-living so that you could own a piece of real estate in which several, maybe potentially several operators could operate. Um, is, that, is that for you a recipe for fast growth? Uh, it is. It's, it's, it's honestly hard for us to uh, scale our business quickly because the real estate development cycle just takes so long. We, you know, what we don't typically do is, is a lot of adaptive reuse or repositioning existing assets for co-living. It's hard to work inside an existing envelope and have a really good user experience. So we take the approach where, it, you know, we prefer ground up development, you know, start from a blank canvas. And we design our buildings based on um, really what zoning allows in each given market. And so we have sort of a template um, for, for each market. Um, 
during the development process, um, every co-living operator that we work with wants to be involved. Uh, I completely understand why. Um, but what we're careful to do is not make the building so specific to one operator that if that operator fails, we can't just swap in another. So we'll take, we'll take an operator's preferences uh, into consideration, but it's not the end all be all. So, um, you know, just to give you some examples of what I mean by, um, you know, market specific development in Seattle, there's no uh, limit to unit count. You're limited by FAR, your floor area ratio. So a certain envelope, a certain square footage for the lot size. Uh, because there's no unit count limitations, we build micro studios in Seattle. Los Angeles, on the other hand, um, their zoning code also restricts number of units on a given lot size. So not only do you have the FAR, the square footage uh, restrictions, you also have unit count restrictions. And so we build fewer units, but they're huge units. Um, and we build five, six, seven bedroom, seven bath units, obviously leasing by the bedroom. Um, and so each bedroom bathroom operates really as a micro studio. Um, it's sort of a zoning arbitrage or a co-living hack, if you will, for, for that market. Um, but any of the, at least US-based operators have no problem swapping in and out of our, our buildings. Um, and so I think anyway, we're lowering sort of the risk uh, for our investors who are taking, you know, Neil mentioned massive amounts of risk. In some cases, you know, $100 million of total project cost risk uh, to build a building that can really be used for one business model. So cool. in other words, you're, you're developing brick and mortar intelligence specific to that co-living niche, right? Exactly. Um, Ricardo and Anil, does that, would that, does that work for you? Um, the fact that a, forgive me, Bob, <laughs> a, you know, separate um, real estate investor just builds out a, a building and, and offers you to operate it without um, maybe your specifications prior to construction? I'm uh, not um, completely accurate in that question. No, but I, look, I think I think what Bob's saying is like, you know, a hotel, build, someone who was building a hotel would say, okay, I might hand it to Marriott or the Ace Hotel or the Hoxton. Um, they can play around with it, right? Their colors, their PIP plan, you know, hey, spend five grand right. a key and get sort of on brand. But that might be a few million out of the hundred million. It's a few percentage and you can play with that. But the envelope... Um, is consistent because it's a hotel. And so I agree with Bob in that sense of, you know, as a property owner and investor, you want to keep something where, you know, it fits into some sort of asset class, whether it's a very bespoke co-living building that, but still works. And then you just get into like, you know, a, a bit of like, what's your style? What's your, what's your design side? And I think that's a smart way of, 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 of approaching it as an owner. Um, now, how specific into co-living versus multifamily traditional, do you want to get as a property owner? I think that's a big decision that people have to make. That's the bigger decision rather than like the veneer of a bit of a little bit of a change between one operator's preference and branding look versus another. That's much more of like, okay, Hilton likes it blue and Marriott likes it red and you know, okay, fine. I'm an operator, I can toggle. But I think the bigger question is, are you building very bespoke buildings or actually is there a model for putting co-living into slightly more traditional um, yeah. apartments? buildings overall and you know maybe that's another topic for another day. Carter do you stand by that? Yeah 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 I mean I agree I think it's you know I don't I don't see any of the co-living operator today having developed uh, brand standards anywhere near what you know the brand standards of hotel operators like Hilton, Marriott or you know etc cetera, etc. Cetera. I think, you know, there's also one of the main questions today is what is it really co-living? Is it, you know, just purpose-built co-living? Is it multifamily? So I think when it comes to purpose-built co-living, yes, it could be an issue, uh, even though I think there are a lot of similarities between asset classes like purpose-built co-living and purpose-built student accommodation, for instance, even though planning might be different may, from a layout perspective. But from a multifamily or residential perspective, I think the risk both from the real estate side in terms of securing another operator or securing a management contract from uh, companies like CBRE or Savills should be fairly low risk and fairly simple uh, procedure. When we, when we sign up new leases on whether it's residential, uh, multifamily or, or purpose-built, we always 
A, we want to make sure that there are some brand standards. We don't have, as I said, brand standards as Hilton and so on. But we also want to make sure that the lease eventually can be transferable uh, to other operators. And that's typically something that the developer would ask anyway. Um, okay, I had tons of questions for you, Rick, but uh, we're running out of time. So I'm going to ask you a, a mix of questions so you can uh, add your, uh, your conclusions to this panel. Um, Stony, for you, um, do you think that a co-living company needs to scale and to scale fast to reach high valuation or to survive? And then Anil, Bob and Ricardo, what can you say about uh, the evolution of co-living, especially talking about sustainability? We had a few questions about sustainability in there. Um, Bob, I liked your approach of the blueprint approach because it allows not to build, you know, not to go for new builds each time you, you want to develop a new co-living asset. Uh, but is, are there any other um, success factors for sustainable co-living growth? Any of you? you think? Do you want me to go first, Claire, on that quick one? I, I think that the answer is uh, yes, they have to scale quickly in order to achieve a high valuation. However, I think that there is a lot of room in the market um, for smaller local operators. And I think that can be for big assets, small assets. I think it's like the hotel industry. One group might have two or three bed and breakfasts, and that's a great model for them in that market. And, you know, another group might be Hilton and they operate globally. And, you know, they have a very sort of um, standard product across around the world. So I think there's room for everybody, but I think you do have to scale fast to, to achieve a high valuation. Okay. But you don't have to have a high valuation. That I think is another, another point that I'd make, which is it may not be that that's sort of the end all and be all. Um, so you, don't, you don't have to be a year. There's room for boutique operators, I think. Right. I yeah. agree with that. Uh, Bob, maybe the oh, other. The the <laughs> Do you agree? <laughs> what, what are your thoughts for the future of, of co-living and its growth? Yeah, I think, I think if you're, um, we, we've watched co-living in the U.S. grow up anyway. I know the United States in a lot of ways is behind, certainly behind Asia um, and to some extent behind Europe. Um, co-living is, is, I would say people describe it, um, has really only been around, um, it's been around forever. But again, co-living in its current iteration has been around since 2014, 2015. Stoney might push that back by a couple of years, but a lot of the operators really kind of reached this inflection point then. Um, and, and I would say in, the, in that five, six, seven year period of time, things have changed pretty, pretty dramatically. That's very difficult from a, from a real estate investor and developer perspective, because it takes us four or five years to build our buildings. And so, yeah, you really have to see five years ahead um, and, and, and really try to figure that out. And it has been a real challenge for us. Um, I think fortunately we've kind of figured out sort of a, um, a template or, or, or a model that, that works. Um, you know, we may have to, uh, as Anil said, change sort of paint colors or tiles or, you know, things like that, but we kind of know what works. Um, affordability is, is the most important amenity. So we, we don't over amenitize our buildings, which then creates, you know, um, price inflation. We try to keep things affordable and we try to keep things sustainable. Um, one of the things I love about co-living, um, or at least most of the operators that we work with is they include utilities um, in, in the monthly rent, which means that the utilities are part of our, our P&L, part of our income statement. It's, it's an expense that we pay. So unlike most multifamily property developers, it never makes sense to invest in sustainability because utilities are passed through to your tenants. You don't recapture the upside from you know, a more efficient building. Well, in our case, we do. Um, and if we're selling the building at a four cap, that's a 25 multiplier that, you know, that, that let's say hundred thousand dollars that we save on energy efficiency falls right to the, right to the bottom line. And at a four cap, that's 25 times multiplier. Uh, the building is worth suddenly significantly more. And so um, I love that co-living is sort of at this intersection of um, a lot of social good. Um, I talked at the beginning about win, 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 win. Um, and I think that's why co-living is really just going to be um you know, the future of, of multifamily real estate um, in these very expensive cities throughout the world. Anil and, and Rick, as you prepare your conclusions for us, can you build upon that um, contrast that Bob rightfully brought up between the slow pace of real estate 
and the fast pace of your growth and your evolution, your, you know, your agility. Go on, Anil. You start. Um, are you saying, Claire, like, can you balance those or just, I'm just trying to think of how to respond. Well, my question is not that targeted. <laughs> what do, my question is, what do you think of this in general? But yeah, that's, that's the question I ask myself every day. Can you balance those? It's a hard balancing act. I mean, Bob said, you know, you don't want to be, you can't be everything to everyone, but you don't want to be nothing to no one <laughs> um, on some of these things. And so, you know, there, this whole industry has, you have to choose if you're on some hand, uh, high volume, low margin operating business and do that really efficiently um, to make an operations work asset light. Um, on the other hand, if you're asset heavy, you can make a lot of money on a couple of buildings, right? Because you're deep and you're capturing a lot of value in that chain. Um, and so we've chosen the middle ground. Hopefully we're not no, nothing to nobody. And, uh, you know, but we think there is a nice balance and it's not a completely, uh, you know, like when we look at it, um, this isn't a path people haven't taken before. If you look at the multifamily industry, they were asset heavy and asset light. They, they were fully vertically integrated. Most US multifamily are owner operator. And then, you know, Stoney's kind of mentioned before, they become sort of asset managers. And that's where I think you become asset right. You're an asset manager, not necessarily an owner. And that's where you might own 5% of an asset, but you, by doing that and having skin in the game, you're getting the benefit of a bit more economics on the value creation. You get a bit more of the upside on the asset creation, but you still get the operational, maybe asset management fees and operations fees. So I think you can do that, but that takes a very different skill set to be an asset manager than an operator that's, you know, bringing in people who've invested, who have that track record, et cetera. So it's not a simple path to just sort of get there. Um, it takes time, effort, and experience. Whereas I think um, some of these other models that you talked about growth, you know, yeah, you can sign a master lease and be in business next week. I mean, it's a low barrier to entry proposition, right? Um, and so it's just something to think about for everyone. Is that also a deal with the devil? <laughs> Open yeah i mean you know like why are european owners signing master leases with people because they're being lazy and they think uh, you know an operator's kind of overpaying to grow their vc funding they're get they're taking on 100 percent of the risk at market and they're like hey good luck with it and, you know sometimes that's greater fool theory i mean a lot of people did that in co-working with leases and they all came back to them um so you have to be careful so it could be the deal with the devil but you could also be very shrewd and and you know i think people going through COVID can find ways of maybe creating a hybrid one and maybe sharing a little bit of that risk return on a master lease with people. And, and, you know, maybe it's a hybrid, right. And that could be a smart thing to do. So, you know, I don't want to be binary on the point. I, I think it's just a lot more nuanced and you, you just got to be very careful when you strike these deals. Rick, do you want to, I mean, from, from my perspective, I think what I've uh, sort of noticed uh, looking at, for instance, the, the student accommodation industry in the past, that typically it's always opco propco, right? Or, uh, or fully integrated. And I always struggle to see particular value at a, on the opco side, always the, the propco, the, op, the value is always on the propco. So the reason for us to start opco and asset light only was really to try and get, beside getting uh, market share quickly and scaling quickly, was also to try and create shareholder value on the opco side. That scale, and once we get to that point, eventually start getting involved on the on the propco side. So that was really the the rationale for us, um, and I think it's working quite well. I think you know, uh, in terms of barriers to entry for for uh, operators or asset light operators, I have no doubt that you know anyone can tomorrow start a, a co living company. But there's very different uh, co living companies out there, right? You have. Uh, Lifestyle brands, you know, it could be the house one, husband and, and wife starting a co-living business in, uh, you know, Copenhagen. that's a one, two man show and that's it. You know, anyone can do that. The, the difference is when you start scaling and getting full buildings rather than individual apartment and the individual houses. I don't think the, I think the barriers to entry for operators are seriously, you know, aiming to scale are not as low as a lot of people think. Because you know, signing, securing long-term leases or management agreement on uh, two, three, four, or five thousand square meters buildings, 
it's not it's not a very easy task. <laughs> I agree. It requires a lot of trust, right? Steny, you're on mute, but uh, you get the final words if you want. Can we unmute Stony? Yeah. Oh, I was going to say, and my final point is having now tracked this for some time, I'll, I'll echo, you know, sort of Bob's win, win, win thing because there is truly value for the person living there, right? That they're paying a lower rent and getting a better experience. And because there's a sustainable, you know, growth oriented business model, I think on the Opco side, I think that the price of capital is too high. I think over time, there will be people like me that invest in opcos and they say, I'm happy to make a reasonable return on that. I don't need 10X in three years. I think the early guys you know, have been sort of overly um, high octane, but I think that as markets evolve, things become more efficient and people just realize that there is value, like, it, like there would be in any sort of maybe more old fashioned business that's not a massively scalable tech business. So I think there's a sustainable opco and a profitable opco um, opportunity there. And then on the Propco side, it makes more money, right, than traditional real estate. So that's sort of the good news. And that will not be the case forever, I think, as well, as markets become more efficient. And all of us that are in this world early days, I think, will benefit from that rising tide. And, um, and so that's the thought I wanted to leave. Extend the pie. I think that's an amazing conclusion. Um, I see the Coolive team getting ready for... Uh maybe the end of this summit. So thank you very much to all four of you. Uh, it was great both preparing this talk and uh, actually having the conversation with you all. Uh, thank you, and Guy, I think it's up to you now. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Claire. Thanks, thank thanks you, everybody. Claire. appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much for attending uh, and for, for being here and for sharing. Thank you also, Claire, for moderating. Um, it's, uh, it's been a true honor to also finish uh, this part of the CoLab Summit with this panel um, and having you coming in from the US and from Europe. Uh, I'm standing here with the entire CoLab team and we are about to do a little closing, but before that we do want to show you two more things. Um, and before actually showing you these things, we do have a poll. We do have a poll, and Virginia is ready to pull the poll. So, the last the, poll. The last poll. Yes. She's so sad. Look at her. So sad. <laughs> yes. So the poll really is about like how you see the future of co living, how you want to get involved into the future of co living. This is your chance right now to uh, decide uh, whether and how you're going to be involved as a major stakeholder in the co living movement. Oh, we're gonna give look you at those oh. votes coming in. Yes, they are coming in very slowly, but they are coming in. <laughs> <laughs> and it's the end of the day, but not actually. Uh -huh. It's uh -huh. the end of one thing, but the beginning of another. It truly is, because as you can see, we changed our background. And mm, I'm not exactly so sure what's behind it, but it seems like it is about the Co Living Awards ceremony. And so maybe. I think rooms are ready. So before we do the rooms, ladies and gentlemen, we still have two things to show you. Enjoy.
Oh yes, oh yes, oh yes. Ladies and gentlemen, this was the Call of Summit 2021. Woohoo! Thank you for being with us. Thank you for being with Thank us. Thank you. You've been truly amazing sitting and being with you for the last two days. And we have a huge round of applause to give to everybody that participated. You guys are truly amazing. Thank you for shaping the future of co -living. Thank you also to all of the amazing team. Let's give a big round of virtual applause for everybody that's here from Virginia, Xavier, Fabrice, Bart, Christian, and on my left, Matt, the amazing Sandra, and of course the amazing Kate. I'm gonna give a round of applause. And then also all of the rest of the team that is virtual. Thank you, Nabil. Thank you, Mayan. Thank you, Lucy. Thank, thank you, Van. Thank you, Connor. Yes. Thank you, all the ambassadors. And yes. thank you, all the moderators. Yes. And thank you, all the speakers. Yes. And then also thank you of all of the partners who have been supporting totally. this event. Thank you so much, Salsa System. Thank you, Kushman. Thank you, all of the partners that have joined in the last moment to support our organization, to support Colif Summit, and to make this event happen. I also would like to say, I know I'm putting the tone down for a, a second, bit. that I was quite blown away actually from the whole event and what we achieved and the, all the feedbacks that we had and everything, but it's not ended because what's going to happen tomorrow? Uh, tomorrow? Oh yes, tomorrow we do send out something. Do you want to say what it is, Kate? Sure, why not? <laughs> why not? So, uh, you will receive an email, of course, from us tomorrow uh, with uh, a little recap of what we've done in these two fantastic days, some of the links that a lot of you have asked, a little surprise with regard to membership, if I'm not wrong. Yes, because a lot of our attendees, a lot of you guys have asked us whether we can or whether you can upgrade to the membership because you didn't see that there was this. Uh, complete ticket for th membership plus summit and so we decided to offer the membership for all of you for half the price if you weren't able to join it before uh, and I think it's gonna be valid until Monday or Tuesday yeah we'll decide tomorrow we'll decide tomorrow <laughs> that's that's how we do things <laughs> so. and it works and it works, <laughs> and it works. Yeah, well, I think we proved it so I, I am very proud of all of us yes and then the other thing that you're going to receive is uh, for those who weren't able to attend all of the talks you're also, of course, going to get uh, the talks uploaded in video format. Please bear with us. Give us like one or two weeks so we can process it, everything. But we're going to give you the link, and it's going to be in your inbox so that you can see whenever you want all of the talks that you've been missing. Totally. And anyone from the team want to say something else before we wrap up? We pass uh, over to the guys at the Colivian Awards, and we say our goodbyes. Yes, please stay. Please stay with us. Just in a few seconds, we're going to be back for Cleaving Awards, the first ceremony. Yeah, so what's going to happen is that we're going to now uh, start with the last, the very, very last breakout room, or break, however you prefer. And after that, you will be back still here and the fantastic first edition of the Cleaving Awards, which we are very proud to host in our own Cleave Summit and in this space, will begin. Correct. So for those who are new and for those who just joined because of the Co Living Awards, you're going to be put right now into breakout rooms with four to five other people. Uh, and this is the time for you to connect and to get to know your peers and fellow friends in the Co Living industry. Uh, and our recommendation is very simply to explain who you are, what you do, um, but also where you want to bring uh, the Co Living scene in the future. And also I would like to uh, add if yes, I may, of best course. of luck to every single one who is participating to the awards, to everybody who put the application in, not everybody got to the final, but I heard, I heard, and I guess we will see in a few moments that all the applications were fantastic. Thank you for raising the standard of our industry. Thank you for being here. Thank you for joining the third edition of the Colef Summit. And we're gonna see you very soon again. <laughs>